And so I felt like because I am a white woman, because I was in a job where I they weren't going to fire me because I got arrested because people get arrested a lot in Hollywood for far worse than peacefully walking across a no trespass sign, mm -hmm. past a no trespass sign, right? And because I didn't have children um, and because I didn't have to show up to work the next day, usually, usually it, my work did interfere a couple times, but uh, you know, I, I have the ability to be an activist this way, but not everybody does. And that's mm. totally fine. And the, everyone should be the activist they feel most comfortable in. And I guess I've always felt very comfortable. And I love the community of people in the streets and organizing and um, yeah, being more up out there, I mm -hmm. guess, than behind mm -hmm. the scenes. Although I'm a very good envelope stuffer. Hey, hey, everyone, Ella here for this encore episode of Rise and Thrive. And I've got a special co host today with me, Quinn. What's up, babe? Howdy. How are you, babe? Good, good. It's been a minute. This feels so good to get back on the mic. It sure does. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm stoked. Yeah. So you guys, this is an incredible episode we've got uh, coming out. I want to first, we've got Alexandra Paul on the show and I want to first chit chat here with Quinn for a minute, but related to that, um, I was just listening to this episode because we recorded it a little ways back. And it's funny because your name, Quinn, comes up in the very first few minutes, like the very first minute of this episode. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I know you're jumping into this um, to this hosting situation completely blind. So kudos to you. Uh, and it's something really, really random and something a little weird and a little funny. And I'm not going to tell you what it is or anybody that's listening. So you're going to have to wait till the episode comes out. Can't wait. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys, you two have something in common. We do. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Something, oh. something very like kind of off the wall. We're, like we're both lifeguards. I mean, I look I look great in red, so that's probably <laughs> it. Yeah, that's probably You do. It. Not quite as good as you do in purple, but Thank you. You're welcome. Purple's Quinn's favorite favorite color, you guys. Um so yeah, I just think we need to do a little catch up here because it has been a while. We had thought that Rise and Thrive was over and what what was happening just to be totally transparent was that we were working on the next Sexy Fit Vegan podcast to come out and I said well let me let me save Alexandra's and a few other you know really amazing episodes to launch with the new podcast and then as shit happened shit happened and I tore my ACL sparring Muay Thai. I had ACL surgery. Things got put on hold. And so now I said, you know what, let me, let's get these episodes out because they deserve to be out. You guys are going to love them. They're amazing episodes with incredible people, extraordinary humans. Uh, so we are putting out a few encore episodes of Rise and Thrive. And yeah, so what else has been going on since we stopped Rise and Thrive, Quinn? Uh, everything. Life <laughs> is unfolding as it does. Um, I mean, all, all sorts of things. You, I mean, we've now been together a year. Which was right, we celebrated. Year. Yes. Yeah, blew by. Um, and if you guys don't know our story, definitely check out. Uh, I don't know what episode it is right now, but we will put it, we could put it in the show notes. Our how we met story, which is pretty unique, I think, because I don't think a lot of people meet on vegan dating apps. So, spoiler alert: not the people I've spoke to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, "What?" Uh, it's a great story, and um, yeah, and it's 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 fun to tell, and it's and and it's uh, it's really just amazing that you know we're, we're it's been a year that we've been together because it really doesn't you know doesn't feel like that at all. Um, no. Yeah. It, you know, we're just getting started, which is exciting. And I mean, I'm just so, so excited to be part of this podcast and uh, really look forward to uh, how it blossoms. Yes. You know, it was funny because we just, I was mentioning just the other day, I don't know what, what conversation were we having? I think it was on text that, and I said, oh, if I was podcasting right now, I'd be sharing about this. And what was it? Uh, onions. 
onions. No, yeah. it was it was deodorant. <laughs> and onions. <laughs> yeah, you guys, there's something something going on. I don't know, but my armpits have been smelling a little like onions lately. And I've been, I don't know if this happens to anyone else, but you know, I, I really work on finding the best totally natural deodorant, which has come a long way over the years. Back in the day, there were not that many options and none of them worked worth a shit. And now there are some pretty good ones. I was using native for a while that was working, but I feel like you kind of cycle, get, get, go through cycles where then they maybe don't work so well anymore. So I've been trying out some new ones. Uh, and the last one I just tried, it kind of made my armpits break out, even though there's no baking soda. I was making my own for a while. So it's a journey. It's a journey finding, finding the right, uh, natural deodorant. Do you have one that you like that you want to recommend? I use Hello. I think that's what it's called. Hello mm -hmm. Fresh or Hello or something to that degree. Um, Vegan cruelty free, I assume. All, all the things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No aluminum. None of the none of the bad stuff. Um, and I don't smell like onions. So no, I think, you don't. But I, I mean, I. It's funny, like the whole idea of smelling. You know, I don't. I really don't smell myself anymore. I remember that being a thing. You know, back mm -hmm. when I was I was eating meat and you know drinking and doing all that stuff, but. Um, I, I smell way more pleasant now, you know, I don't smell like cigarettes and I don't smell like, yeah. I mean, I, I, th I think the meat is, is, is a big part of it. Yeah. I'm um, just a, just a happy body. Um, smells good. I so, mean, I eating decaying, you know, decayed you know, flesh you know. just can't do good for no. body odor. And, and then, then, then coupling that with, with, uh, you know, aluminum and all the nasty stuff that we're putting in, into our our armpits and sweating on it and going straight into our blood system. Yeah. It's just really gnarly. And just what a, what a cruel way to uh, poison us. So, yeah. yeah. Sure well, speaking of good deodorant, if you are, if you, if you smell of onions, please. <laughs> it's not, I, it's not a strong smell. Like Quinn didn't notice, no, but I know I noticed a little. So, and you know, I'm, I live in Miami and it's, it's, I'm outside a lot. I'm training like, all the time. And if anything, onions, onions was was, was from a past uh, <sighs> s smell of mine, if you will. So I just equated it to onions. But no, the the woman smells delightful of flowers. <laughs> like she does not smell of onions. It's just I just thought it was a funny thing to uh, funny. <laughs> Well, and then I said, well, at least you like onions because you do actually like onions. I, like I can't onions. do the raw onions. I'll do the sauteed onions. But I'm a fan of all onions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good stuff. Good stuff. And if, if you like this kind of conversation, you guys, and you're not signed up for my newsletter, my Soul Aligned Sunday newsletter, that is something I'm going to keep up with. I've got people uh, emailing back saying this has become my favorite read. I share all sorts of great stuff, you know, all very aligned with a holistic health I get pretty, you know, vulnerable sharing about smelling like onions, things like that. And then recommending, of course, any of the discoveries I make that help me be the healthiest, health, happiest human I can be. Uh, and, and then also recommending, you know, supplements or brands that I've found that I use and I recommend as well. So uh, it's a fun newsletter, fun read, also very valuable, sexyfitvegan.com forward slash newsletter. Uh, you can go sign up. It's great. Great newsletter, I have to say. So it really myself. is. I mean, I look forward to it every Sunday. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm a, <laughs> you're not biased, biased or anything. <laughs> but uh, it, you know, it it does the job. Yeah, and then I'll be we'll be sharing on in the newsletter when our next you know podcast is coming out and all that good stuff too. So let's um let's get into it. Uh, we've got Alexandra Paul, like I mentioned, on the show today. She is, I'm not going to read her bio. I, I go to the show notes for the bio, but I, I just want to say, you know, she's an acclaimed actress. She's a health advocate. She was of course, star of Baywatch, probably what she's most known for in the acting world, but she's been uh, a feature in over a hundred uh, shows and in television series. So that's pretty extraordinary. But what I love her for is her commitment to making a, a positive impact in this world. She's been arrested, I think close to 30 times. She um, she is all about the animals. She's all about regulating population uh, in terms of sustainability. Uh, and she just she just cares so much. And her and I have a lot in common. She struggled for a long time with eating disorders. 
And she has overcome that, but is very open and vocal about how, how she overcame it and what life is like for her now. And this is a deep dive with her. It's a really intriguing episode, and I can't wait for you all to hear it. So let's dive in. Oh, Alexandra, I am so honored that you're here. I'm really to be able to share uh, this time and space with you. I see you as someone who has paved your own really powerful path from a very young age and your deep commitments to making this world a healthier, more just and loving place for everyone really it inspires me. And I'm so grateful for you to be on our show. Well, thank you so much, Ella. It's so nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. And as a side note, I was just listening today to one of your recent uh, episodes on Switch for Good podcast, and you had talked about mouth taping at night. Oh, okay. Yeah, just yes. a random, like random fun fact. Uh, my partner, uh, Quinn, he tapes his mouth at night and I had never heard of that before. And he swears by it. And because it works so well for him, it works very well for me because he is quiet. He sleeps so deeply. It does no snoring. And as minute he takes it off and it falls asleep, it's snoring. It's it's amazing. Interesting. So when you met him, was he already mouth taping? Yep. He was uh, already so mouth taping. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good. Yes. It it really does help with snoring. And also I don't do it for snoring. My husband says I don't snore. He says I purr. I don't I know. I love that. I'm not sure. But um but I do it because I read a book about, it was called The Oxygen Advantage, but mm. I read other books subsequently, Breath for one, well, um, James Nestor is a very good author. And he talks about the benefits of breathing through your nose. And I was definitely a mouth breather. Mm. And so this has helped me a lot. Not only when, like sometimes if I if I have a cold sore, I won't put a tape tape on. Sure. Or if I've put like too much um, moisturizer on my lips, the tape won't stick and I won't um, sleep with it. Uh, and I notice that I my instinct is to breathe through my nose now. So that's good. Okay. So it's like training you also yeah. to do yeah. it without the tape. Oh, that's so interesting. Exactly. But I think I'll just keep with the tape because it's just it's so easy. And I must look really funny when I'm getting, if somebody like, if I'm, you know, I, I go to the bathroom at night, if somebody encountered me in the hallway, there I am with my, um, my tape on and my mouth guard in. Right. <laughs> and I used to also sleep. I used to have issues with, um, and I think it was a little bit of an iron deficiency. So I've solved that, but okay. I used to have, um, like restless leg. Oh. And the only thing that helped was when I put toe spacers on. For oh. some reason, I can't explain why Interesting. it helped for my sister too. So um, anyway, so can you imagine me going to the bathroom, mouth tape, right. start mouth on and toe spacers. <laughs> do you clench, do you clench your teeth? Is that why you do mouth guard? Yes, that's yeah. why I have mouth guard. So yeah. do I. I yeah. think we have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> I also have, uh, I don't think I have restless leg, but I, I'm very, my skin or something is very sensitive to like the sheets. If there's a little fold in the sheets or if, you know, if I feel, then I'll, I'll have to move. So I'm, I'm awful to sleep with. I feel sorry for, <laughs> for anyone sleeping with me. <laughs> oh goodness. Okay. So one of the things I like to ask my guests, um, uh, because you have an extensive bio and you've accomplished so much in between your accomplishments and your activism and your acting and your, all the accolades, Behind or that all that or beyond all that, who is Alexandra Paul? How would you answer that? Um. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I consider myself very much a twin. I'm a twin, and uh, so that's very important to me. My twin sister. And I've been with my husband too for 28 years. So I do also consider myself uh, actually very good taste in men and a good partner to him. Um, but I also um, consider myself someone who struggled with an eating disorder and overcame it most importantly, and deals with a lot of Anx not anxiety, but worry more than I know that as I look back on my life, I'll go, why do you worry so much? Mm. Um, and I 
my guiding principle is what Ingrid Newkirk said, which is be kind, be kind, be kind. And that's, that's sort of how the most important thing. And I mm -hmm. look, I look at the world through a lens of environmental ethic. So when I see a car, I think, hmm, what's the mileage on that car? Is it electric? I don't look at the design or how mm. fast it goes or technological marvel. No, it's about how it affects the environment. And the same with, uh, I also, and also animals, of course. So I look through the lens, the life through that, that lens, pretty mm -hmm. much everything is through an environmental or an animal justice lens, I would guess. Right. Yeah. And you were what in sixth grade, I found this so fascinating that you were in sixth grade when you really made a conscious choice that you were going to be child free. Like I'm trying to think of some of your milestones along your life when you had this kind of moment of, ah, I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to do something about this problem that I'm that I'm learning about or seeing. And that seems like a big one. Can you tell yeah. about that story? Thank you. Well, I grew up in the 70s when there were a lot of commercials uh, about uh, starvation in India and Africa. And there were a lot of commercials about it on. And so I was very affected by that and thought, well, there's too many people in the world to feed everybody was the message that I got. And that was a very simplistic message. But then when I was in sixth grade, uh, my Glee Club teacher, Mr. Collins, said that we had to change the words in this song that we were singing because it said um, three billion people. Wait, what did it say? Did it say three? It would have been four billion people in the world because when I was born in 1963, there were three billion people. And he said, you need to change it to... No, you need to change it to 4 billion because there are now 4 billion people in the world. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? 4 billion people? That's so many. And that was really an eye opener for me. And I did tell my mom that I wasn't going to have children. I might have might adopt, but I wasn't going to have my own because there were too many kids in the world. And she said, oh, honey, you'll change your mind mm -hmm. once your biological clock tick clicks in, which... Um, it didn't really, mm -hmm. I think it, it didn't, um, I probably, because I was so strongly aligned with my ethics about mm, not having too many people on the planet crowding out animals and, and, and also other people, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's so interesting. We've got quite a little circle of you, you me, Dotsy, women and i've got two really close girlfriends who you know chose not to have children and i think things are changing culture is changing but there's still that does your did your mom ever at what point did your mom know that that was not going to happen was she was she disappointed did she was she hoping you would have children i have two siblings and none of us have children which right. is interesting. Um, my brother had a vasectomy when he was 21 because he felt so strongly about the animals and the environment. And um, my sister, my twin is gay. And so for a long time, she, there wasn't even a question about whether she was going to have kids or not. So I think she also grew up in, with a life that was child free. And so my mom, yes, she has cried over the fact that she has no grandchildren. And she now recognizes that there are benefits because now we're there for her 100% uh, because we don't have children. So we're able to take care of her. Now, the question is, what about us when we get older? Mm -hmm. um, and that was a question that I, I wrestled with when I was 40 and my dad, uh, we were taking care of my dad. Um, I thought, well, who's going to take care of me when I'm older? And mm -hmm. what am I missing? These are the questions. And well, maybe I could adopt a kid and save a child. And mm -hmm. my husband looked at me, he said, you know, all those are not, I'm not hearing you say you want a child. Uh -huh. Those aren't strong enough reasons to raise a child. And so, um, yeah, I decided to take out long-term healthcare insurance instead so that when I am older, I can help myself be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's that's interesting because that certainly has popped in my head, you know, the the older I start, start to get. And some of my friends without children, we've all been like, well, what if we have our own little commune and we hire a, you know, we have a mutual... A, a kitchen with a, a vegan nurse, you know, <laughs> to help us out where we need it. And we'll have a, like, can we create that? So we're, we're exploring all sorts of possibilities. Well, mm-hmm. that's the thing. You're right. I mean, I have friends too, that we're talking about that also because I yeah. have so many friends who are child-free and having children doesn't guarantee any way that you're right. taken care of. No. And it costs a lot of money to raise one child, two child, three children, the average number of children per family now in the world is 2.3. So in America, we have on average 2.1. Oh, yeah, 2.1. It might be, I think it's under now. It's might be, it's under two now, but still it's very expensive. So, mm-hmm. um, and I don't want to reduce children to money, but right. we could we could find ways to take care of ourselves as we're older other than just depending on our children right. or our child. Yeah. Yeah. And as you said, you you have a child. There's no guarantee that that child's going to be around or be wanting to take care of you or capable of taking care of you or yeah, no guarantees there. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, not a reason to have children. So we have more control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And at what point did you uh, really feel called to, make overpopulation, you know, something that you are really vocal about, that you are going to use your platform for, that you are going to actually do a TED talk on it? Um, I, in 19, uh, sorry, in, yeah, 1991, I developed a school program where uh, another, a professor and I went around to schools in the LA area and spoke on the issue of human numbers and how fast we were growing to try and combat the pronatalist, um, culture that we have, Mm -hmm. which basically assumes that you're going to have children and preferably two or even back then three. Um, And because, you know, lonely children, only children are lonely children, supposedly. Yeah. Um, And so we we developed a program and I spoke to um, over 6,000 school children during that time. I took time off from acting to do that. Because I felt so strongly that, you know, there were, and back then there were uh, five billion people, five and a half billion. So it was, you know, many fewer because now we have over eight billion. So obviously my work has not, (laughs) has not worked. (laughs) I was born, as I said, when there were three billion and now I'm 60 there are 8 billion has the population's more than doubled and it's quadrupled in my mother's lifetime. And I'm just so concerned about it because I hear people talking about so many issues like mm-hmm. climate change or animals, habitat, wildlife, clean water, available water, um, all that stuff. And it's all to me, housing, it's all tied traffic. It's all tied in. Even if it's just peripherally, it's all tied into the number of people that are on the planet. And I, I, I am concerned that people are so afraid of talking about this issue because there have been bad actors who've tried to stop people from having kids. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be clear that I don't want to stop people from having kids. If you want kids and you really want them, have them, but think about the future and consider having only one or two at the most and if you don't really want them, don't have them because they're, it's such an important job. And there's so many people who just kind of fall into mm-hmm. parenting because of cultural pressures. What is, I, I mean, it's just another issue that's so taboo because of the programs where fed from the time we're born that that's what you're supposed to do. All these supposed to, you know, habits and the way you're supposed to live your life and it seems like you've been, and I've, you know, with me with animals too, been somebody who just kind of was able to see that programming for what it was and make your own decisions. What, what do you think, where do you think that came from? Like, did that, was that innate in you? I, I've never felt, well, maybe, you know, I've, I've, been in a life that doesn't isn't very traditional being an actress there's a lot of acceptance a lot of um my friends in hollywood don't have children didn't get married 
um, all the, uh, if they had children, some of them uh, didn't have partners. So it was a very conscious decision. And so I think also my environmental ethic is so important. I mean, I really, I grew up first with an environmental ethic and then now it's broadened to include animals uh, first and foremost, but uh, very much an environmental ethic and seeing that it just was logical to me just like we see overpopulation of deer and then the deer starve and <laughs> people can also overpopulate, but humans get very angry. If you start saying that, mm -hmm. um, that we are overpopulated because we somehow believe that we don't, what, um, we don't have to abide by the laws of nature and, and math. Um, but the truth is, is that when we ask for a world that has fewer people, that's better for everybody on the planet, because right now there's so many have nots. Mm -hmm. And when we have fewer people on the planet, everyone will be able to share what's what Mother Earth can provide instead of having rich people and very poor people. The people who are going to suffer most when the population reaches 10 billion, which it's the UN says it's going to reach um, this century mm -hmm. around uh, in about 50 years, we are the ones that are going to suffer most. So often people will say that people who talk about limiting fertility, that somehow I must be racist or classist or something. No, I, I care deeply about the world's poorest and want believe that everybody, everybody needs to have smaller families, especially those of us in America, right, who use so much. Right. So it's an issue that, like, unfortunately, I touched on had a, had bad actors in the 70s where China was forcing people mm -hmm. to have abortions and have fewer kids. And India was doing the same. And there has been um, sterilization of different uh, groups of people. That is not at all part of what I see at all. I want people to see the positive side of being child free like you and I see instead of getting uh, brainwash, which it is brainwashing a lot about how wonderful, um, parenthood is. And it is wonderful, but it's, it's not all wonderful. And being child-free is also wonderful. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's looking at both sides of the, that, that coin. is so important. I think also looking back now to kind of the next milestone vegetarian at age 14, right is when you went yes. vegetarian yeah. and diet for a small planet was the book that helped yeah. you get there. Yeah. Ella, thank you so much for doing your homework. Yeah. Oh I appreciate that. <laughs> no, your, your story is fascinating. The, the biggest in preparing for this interview was like, oh my gosh, I want to talk about so many things. Where are we going to go with this? Because I, I, you've just had such a, a colorful life and I, and there's so much, to it, um, especially when you've been in the public eye and you've had so many things to deal with in your life that, you know, I've never had to deal with a lot of people listening, having to deal with. And yet the things you are dealing with are very relatable to a lot of people. So um, it's just fascinating to me uh, how you've how you've been so courageous in using your platform to do good and to make an impact. And I want to cover all of that as the best we can. So yeah, 14 at, at 14 decided to go vegetarian. And then, and and was it just reading the book? Can you share a little bit more about what went into that decision? Diet for a Small Planet is a book by Francis Ford Le Moore LePay written in the early 70s. So this was about 1976, I think I went, let's see, uh, 1976, 1977 that I went vegetarian. And it was basically for environmental reasons. She was making the argument that we should, she kept eggs in. So it wasn't at all, a, and probably milk too. So it wasn't an animal treatise at all. It wasn't until I was in high school and I did a book report on the book Animal Liberation by Peter Singer that I saw the animal component uh, very strongly. And my brother at the same time, uh, we were we went to boarding school as kids and he was in a different boarding school, but he he became vegan and at very young age and i remained vegetarian for way too long right and you talk about that and then you between high school and college 
you took some acting classes, you're doing some modeling, took some, and you, you talked about how something opened up for you at that time. What, what opened up? Well, are you talking about in terms of just, yeah, no, away from, yeah. In terms of life, like just it sparked something in you that, that helped change the trajectory of, of your oh, life. Yeah. So I was during high school, I had a severe eating disorder. I was anorexic and, but most, most prominently bulimic. And it, it followed me from ages 16 to 28. So I was modeling. Can you believe it? Like I already had an eating disorder and I had to put myself in that somehow for validation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, the, the bulimia got so bad that I left modeling. I moved to Canada to be with my boyfriend and uh, told my agent why. And she said, yeah, then go. Um, and I already had taken a year off before going to college. This was during that time. And so uh, I wasn't planning to be a model more than that year anyway. And during, but before I left, I had auditioned for a TV movie about models and they were looking for an unknown girl to play a model in the lead in the movie. And so I, I got a call back when I was in Canada and had to fly back to New York um, to uh, to audition for it. And then again, and then the third time they flew me to Hollywood and I got the role and that, that was what, yes, definitely changed the trajectory of my life. I moved to Los Angeles and still thinking that I was going to go to college after I did this movie. And then three weeks before I decided, you know, I'm going to be really old when I get out of college, 21. As <laughs> <laughs> only an 18 year old can think, right? Right, exactly. Um, so I better just take advantage of the momentum now and I'm going to stay. And my mom, she she committed the mortal mistake of going back to college when after she divorced my dad when she was 40. And one of her refrains that she would say was, oh, college is wasted on the young. So by the time I got to this <laughs> place, I was... I, I was able to say to her mom, you said yourself that college is wasted on the young. So <laughs> I'm going to take, I'm going to go to college later and, uh, and just see what happens here in, uh, in Hollywood. And I never went to college, uh, because I stayed busy in Hollywood for a long time. Yes, you did. <laughs> how many, how many features, uh, in, in movies, TVs? Uh, I have been in over a hundred movies and television shows, um, mostly have had the fortune to be the first or second female lead. As I've gotten older, I play now, you know, the grandmother, the, the lawyer who does, you know, the, the not the first or second lead, mm -hmm. but I did have very, very wonderful opportunities, um, for the first 30 years of my career. And hopefully more to come because there's a lot of roles for women of all ages. Well, I'm sorry, there aren't a lot, but there are roles mm -hmm. for women of all ages. So, mm -hmm. And one of the things I, I love hearing you talk about is how you put into your contracts uh, some stipulations about what makeup you would wear and that you wouldn't wear fur on set. And I know when I was had a little bout in like fitness modeling, that was something that was always, it actually just caused me to be like, maybe I, I'm not going to, you know, pursue this because I would be so worried about, okay, which, oh, if I get booked by this company, oh, but am I supporting, you know, do they wear, use leather or do they use, you know, but products that test on animals, I, then I'm not going to take that job. And I don't think I could be that picky. How did you, you know, you just put it in there and how did that, yeah, how did that work? Yeah, I was lucky because I was playing the leads then. Mm -hmm. So I had the, if I was playing, uh, well, now it's much easier. So even if I come on set, plus I'm, you know, an old veteran. So if I come on set and say, hey, I can only use stuff to not test it on animals, the makeup artist will be like, oh, I've got a ton of that. Oh, I love that. Or I don't use anything tested on animals. But back then it wasn't very, there were only a couple uh, makeups, MAC, which was not tested on animals then. Now, unfortunately, they do test on animals because of the rules in China and they want to okay. sell in China. And then there was Joe Blasco, which is a very Hollywood brand. Um, so those two did not test. So I was able to, makeup artists were fine with it. Nobody ever complained. Interesting. It was really nice. Of course, the inter internet wasn't around. So it wasn't as easy to just, you couldn't just go Google, does you know this product test on animals? 
or get an app for it. But uh, yeah, so I stuck to Joe Blasco and Mac mostly. Got it. Got it. And let's talk about your, and this fascinates me, all the arrests that you've had with direct activism. At what point did you get into direct activism and civil disobedience? What Do you remember your first, your first arrest? I do. I do. It was in 1987. So I was in my 20s and I was, I had just, <clears throat> I had just been on, I just walked for five weeks across America on the Great Peace March because I was very concerned about nuclear, us all getting blown up by nuclear weapons. That is some, that is an issue that, you know, there was each Russia and America had like, like 20 to 30,000 nuclear weapons on each side. And now we have like, 5,000 or 2,000. So there's been a lot of progress in that area. I'm sure that the ones we have now are far more destructive, but at least we are less apt to be blown up by mistake because there are fewer weapons. But I was very concerned. I was pretty sure at that age, let's see, um, 19, it would be 1986 that I would. So I was 23 that I wasn't going to make it to 35 because of the nuclear issue. So Uh I had been on the Great Peace March and we had um, gone to the nuclear test site in Nevada where all the nuclear weapons were tested above ground and that were continuing to be tested underground now after laws had passed to protect groundwater and such. But you know, it gets in there anyway, folks. But so I, w- I went back to the test site after uh, walking on the Great Peace March from L.A. to Las Vegas. I went back several times a year, actually, for the next 15 years to do um, peaceful civil disobedience. And um, so that first time, yeah, it was 1987, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know you talk about your kind of your privileges that give you a unique opportunity when it comes to direct action. Uh, can you yeah. share a little more about that? And, and I think somebody maybe put that idea in your head and you ran with it. Well, I've always been like my mom was, and people ask like, cause all of us kids are activists. So people yeah. say, well, what, how did you get that way? And my mom was, she always voted. She always gave blood. She donated um, her time, she, she, all sorts of things she would do. She boycotted lettuce when Cesar Chavez's farm workers were boycotting it. And so that kind of, um, walking your talk was very much in our household. So it, but I, and my brother and sister also were more comfortable just being, we, being in the street, holding a sign, vigiling and civil disobedience, peaceful civil disobedience kind of just felt natural to to us to me certainly and so i i think one of the reasons and so i felt like because i am a white woman because i was in a job where i they weren't going to fire me because i got arrested because people get arrested a lot in hollywood for far worse than peacefully walking across a no trespass sign, Mm -hmm. past a no trespass sign, right? And because I didn't have children um, and because I didn't have to show up to work the next day, usually usually, my work did interfere a couple times, but, uh, you know, I, I have the ability to be an activist this way, but not everybody does. And that's Mm. totally fine. And everyone should be the activist they feel most comfortable in. And I guess I've always felt very comfortable. And I love the community of people in the streets and organizing and um, yeah, being more up out there, I guess, mm-hmm. than behind mm-hmm. the scenes. Although I'm a very good envelope stuffer back mm-hmm. in the 80s and 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, you did a lot of envelope stuffing because there was no such thing as email. But <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I feel like being a white woman, I wasn't, I'm not afraid of the justice Mm -hmm. system as Mm -hmm. much as a male might be or uh, a person of color. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that first arrest, I actually went to jail for um, several days. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it it was a big learning experience. And subsequently, I've been in jail for just five and a half days was the longest that I went in LA at the LA Detention Center um, for protesting the Iraq war. And and then a couple several days for animals, for uh, rescuing animals. Do you know how many times you've been arrested altogether at this point? 
You know, it's over 24 probably or 25 because I would go back to the, the nuclear test site several times a year and get ar arrested peacefully. And eventually it's interesting that, you know, the point of civil disobedience is not only to, to show how committed you are to get press attention for the cause, but also to pressure the powers that be because it's expensive to arrest everybody and uh, book them and things. And mm -hmm. eventually the government, because uh, that's basically, it was federal land that we were protesting on nuclear testing as a government um, uh, project. Um, they they stopped bringing, busing us to the local jail and instead they just built a fencing in on the property that they would just, that had a bathroom and water um, that they would herd us into, then they'd process us, and then they would um, release us for the most part. It was too mm. expensive to prosecute us. So I only went to jail that for one time because um, after that, they would just drop the charges. And how many more times do you plan to get arrested in your life, do you think? <laughs> oh, many more. Many more. Yeah, yeah, many more. I think it's a, I think civil disobedience is a very effective way of uh, bringing attention to a cause. Mm -hmm. It's not, once again, the, the, the issue has to also have the, uh, all the other aspects right. that the fundraising, the letter writers, the lobbyists, the all sorts of things to affect change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and what caught, like at this point, moving forward, what causes do you feel most connected to or inspired by right now? Right now, I am focused on animal rights and human overpopulation. Those are the two that seem to me to be the most, where I'm most needed as an activist. Uh, I was very much involved with getting electric cars on the road. And I feel like um, because I was, a, I was a part of the very, very beginning, and now it's become so much more mainstream, I, I'm leaving that to the, to other folks and working on issues that I just think are very important also, which is animal rights and uh, human overpopulation. Beautiful. I want you to come at, one day, maybe come visit us at Hogs and Kisses Farm Sanctuary. We've got a beautiful B&B. &B. We'd love to put you up. So we'll put that out there. Thank you so much. That's, I would love that. Yeah, I would love yeah. that. So let's talk a little bit now. I'm, I'm curious how you see, uh, you know, you, you've been, uh, abstinent from uh purging right for and how do you how do you describe it since you were 28 is that yeah, correct yeah so 32 years, years. now yeah so uh, i'm i consider myself abstinent abstinent sounds like such a funny word though so i just say i don't i haven't binged or purged for um 32 years 30 yeah 32 years In so do you consider yourself in recovery as though that you know you're going to be in recovery or do you feel recovered? How do you see that? Yeah, remember Dot Dotsie really feels like she's recovered. I do not. I still use food. I oh, I haven't just to be clear. I haven't binged I haven't binged really in the 31 years. Maybe a little twinge of that because there's a difference between overeating and binging. So fine. Overeating, right. It's it's a mindset, right? Yeah. Yes. So I haven't binged in, the, and I haven't had that desire, that that overpowering craving to just stuff myself till I'm sick and then throw it up. You know, mm -hmm. that sort of self loathing. I haven't had that, but I definitely use food. Like there'll be times when I just do not eat well, and mm -hmm. I go right to sugar, and I'll stay on eating sugar because it's comforting, but I don't binge on it. I just eat it and I don't eat enough vegetables. So I would say that that is where my uh, work lies. Um, but like my husband's been with me for 28 years and he says, oh, Alexandra, you have improved so much. You're like, you're almost normal now. <laughs> Whatever normal is, right? Uh -huh, right. Um, but still, you know, sugar remains my Achilles heel. Okay. I would say that I'm addicted to sugar and there are times when I've gone off it, but then there are other times basically where I am able to keep it really a good place in my diet. And then it kind of starts to creep more and more and more. And then I have to pull back. So I have to always be vigilant. Does that, does that sound familiar to you? 
Oh, definitely. I think there's, and it is, it's, it's the mindset when it comes to what we're eating, how much we're eating. And for me, it's this very much ability now to be conscious with my meal, to be conscious of making a conscious choice. So sometimes I consciously make a choice that is not the healthiest choice. And I'm still making that choice. It doesn't feel like the food has the power over me, if that Ah. makes sense. Yes, that's a beautiful way to put it. Yes, I totally agree. I I feel that that's where I am. And then I will, however, go to periods where I feel like, uh uh-oh, it's getting a little bit too much and I have to pull back. Yeah. Yeah. I pretty much, a a few years ago, I, I cut out sugar altogether for a good maybe six weeks, all refined sugar, even stevia, anything that would maybe prompt a craving for sugar. I cut that all out. Even I think I even might have cut out fruit for a little bit just to get that sweet taste because I had gotten to a place where I was eating a little bit of coconut milk ice cream. You know, it wasn't the end of the world. It was the kind without the added sugar. But I felt every night after dinner, I really wanted some and I, I felt like it was an addiction. And I said, I don't, I don't want to be controlled by this. So I I cut out sugar altogether. And I really haven't gone back. Now I can eat a little bit here and there. But in general, it's it's gotten to the point where I'm just I don't crave it. And that's that's the place is a really nice place to be with that. Yes. Uh, that you know is, what I mean? That is for sure. Yeah. And I too have given it up for months. And it's so great which is so weird that I would go back on it, but it's so great not to be. So here's my philosophy about sugar or about anything that, you know, if somebody's struggling with alcohol or, or some specific food is that for me, when it comes to sugar, uh, two is too many and a hundred's not enough. So it's always, so I'm never satisfied wholly Mm -hmm. when I eat sugar. There's always that. Well, when I finish it, I always feel a little bit sad. (laughs) Yes. Oh, and totally. Think, so when am I going to, you know, and I think, okay, well, I'll have some tomorrow or so when you don't eat sugar at all, that just never enters into your mind. Right. So it's, right. There's right. so much more peace, you yeah. know, cause you're like, nope, you know, I know I can't be satisfied anyway. So if I give it up, okay. It's, it's so true. Every time you start, you're always going to have to stop and be like, Oh, I really want a little more, you know? So you have to go through that kind of yes. every it time, not for every time. Every yeah, time, unless you binge, which until you're sick, which is what I used right. to do. And yeah. I don't do that anymore. So it's more like you said, my conscious mind goes, oh, put it down, Alexandra. And there's that little bit of sadness. So it's true. Abstinence can often be easier mm-hmm. than moderation or trying to manage. How do you help, as, you know, as a, as a health coach, when somebody's kind of battling with that? inability to stop once they get started, but maybe they don't have a full out eating disorder, but there's some disordered eating in there. How do you work with somebody around that? So just to be clear, I'm no longer, I closed my health coaching business because of my working with my mom, uh, being with my mom. So I couldn't do both and really be good to both. So, but I had such an education, seven years of coaching. So the, one of the most important things is if somebody wants to cut down on something is to just make it easier for them and not ask them to engage their willpower or white knuckle it because so it's really important that it not be in their environment. Yeah. And when it's not around studies have shown that people, if they have to make an effort to get to something, they're more, more like less likely to do it, the harder it is. Yes. And it can be as simple as just Putting, if you live with a lot of other people, is putting the foods that you crave in a cupboard that's either high or very low and behind so you don't see them. Mm-hmm. If you have it out on the kitchen table, of course you're going to eat it. Yes. Um, and so they're just to get it out of your environment was number is very, very important. And then also to plan ahead about, okay, so you don't want to eat dessert but you're, you know, now you feel like you don't want to eat dessert, but you're going to want to eat it come supper time. So what are you going to do when you start craving? What kind of substitutions, and they might not be food, it might be getting up and turning on some really pleasurable TV show 
Um, what are you going to do instead right. um, to get you out of the habit? Because a lot of our um, eating, for example, is habit. Yeah. And some of it's, and also it helps, of course, with the craving that you talk about is that once we get out of the habit, we also, our body doesn't expect it anymore. And so, you know, we all had habits that we've, we've given up tons of things in our life. Like so many people in college ate pizza every night for dinner, an entire pizza, and they don't do that anymore. So they, we all can change our habits. It seems yeah. hard in the beginning. Yeah. So, so planning ahead and figuring out people always said to me, oh no, I'll just not, I won't, I just won't eat dessert. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. It feels right. like it does, but no, it's not that easy. Otherwise you would have given up dessert a long time ago. What are you going to do instead of having dessert to make you feel good and not deprived so we can get you out of this habit of having dessert every night? Um, so that's a, that's a biggie. The best thing would be to not go to the restaurants that have your dessert, you know, but some people don't, you know, feel like they can't control that part of their lives, like where they eat, especially right. if they have family who want dessert. Yeah. Um, or they go on business dinners. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. Although yeah, I, I had a client once who said, I have to go to di business dinners, B business dinners. I hate them. I hate them. But I said, you know, you hate them. Don't you think like other people hate them too? What if you suggested just, you know, let's just have a uh, meet and have a, a tea or a coffee or a drink if you have to. Let's just have a hors d'oeuvres. Don't you think they want to get home to their families too? Right. No, 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 no. They, they want, I'm yeah. like, no, they don't. <laughs> and then of course, COVID taught us all that everyone's just fine staying yeah. inside. Yeah, totally. And I think also it's that, it's that ability to pause, right? Before, before you take the action. Cause if you don't have that pause, then it's automated and it just goes. So, so training ourselves to pause before we act, and then to have a, I'm calling them declarations these days, you know, affirmation, whatever, but have like this thought ready to counter the thought of, I really want, ah, but let me, let me pause and say, you know, what would I choose if I really loved myself or have, you know, have something there to, to kind of coach ourselves, right? Did I ever tell you my granola story? I don't know. Tell me. Okay. Tell me. <laughs> so I was in my disordered eating days. Uh, I I was addicted to this one granola, this specific granola that you could buy in bulk at Whole Foods. Uh -huh. And it was so delicious. And it was, you know, granola is just so calorie dense. It's loaded with most of them are loaded with with sugar and so sweet and delicious. But it has a health halo. So but it has a health <laughs> halo. It's so true. <laughs> Anywho, I I could not stop myself. Once I started eating granola, I could not stop myself. So I started instead of just not buying granola, I started buying buying it still in bulk, but I would put it in bags in my trunk, and I would carry into my home on the only the amount that I wanted to let myself eat that day. But I was still ruled. I mean, it was better, but I was yeah. still ruled. And then one day, I was with my fitness like this fitness icon in my in my town. And she was with me and I, I opened my trunk and she, and she's like, what is that? And I had this massive bags of granola and she's like, oh no, uh-uh. And she, she just took them. She was, she was hardcore. She just took them and she put them in the dumpster and she's like, no more. And I was like, you know, and I was like, I know, I know. I don't want to be ruled by the granola anymore. <laughs> and anyway. so what happened? How was it for you? Oh, you, no. Did you give I, it up cold turkey? No, no, not at that moment. I still had a lot of inner work to do. I mean, this it's all emotional. I mean, I was filling a void that, you know, yeah. it was definitely, it was, it was a milestone. I mean, I, I started to really do the work at that point. Up until then, it was like the physical, what can I do, right, uh -huh. to manipulate my environment so mm -hmm. that I don't make those choices, not what I could do to manipulate my, my own emotions and really deal with the root of what it was that I was trying to fill. You know what I mean? Well, you, um, but you did touch on something that by having to bring it inside, you made yourself think rather sure. than just you know, and psychologically, we do tend to um, eat from a bag and then we'll finish the bag. But because it takes a little effort to open a new bag, it's, it's like a new thing. We'll 
be le- hence the hundred uh, the hundred calorie snack walls and stuff. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It doesn't it's not always um you know healthy, but it is healthier and it, yeah. and it does is a step towards being more aware. Yeah. And I remember when I was uh just I would start the day for years with a chocolate chip muffin. And my nutritionist said, you can't do that. And I'm like, what? No, I, I, that's, it makes me feel good. One chocolate chip muffin. And then, you know, she's like, no, I want you to have something that doesn't have sugar in it. And I wept, I wept because I said, Mm -hmm. I don't know what else to eat. Well, I haven't had a chocolate chip muffin for two decades. I don't even (laughs) know you find, and I, after you find other things that fill you and then they become things you like and you develop new habits. So I think part of it, of course, is inner work, definitely. But I think also once a lot of it's just mindlessness, habit, yeah. what we've been doing. True. And we can definitely change so much. So much of that is in our control. Because willpower is, people say, oh, Alexandra, you have so much willpower. I'm like, no, it's not willpower. It's not willpower. It's habit. I've changed my habits. Right. And yeah, it took a little bit of awareness and maybe a little bit of willpower that very first time, the first few days. But after that, no. I'm, you know, you learn how to build new habits that usually are healthier Mm -hmm. if you're aware and working on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And then having some goals. I mean, you stopped work for what, nine months to prepare for an, and you did an Ironman. You did the Hawaii Ironman. I did. I did the Hawaii That's Ironman. Insane. Oh my gosh. I am in yeah. awe of anyone who does the Ironman. Like, and that's a, and so you trained for nine months and you really hadn't, you were already, you know, swimmer, but not biking, not, you had never done a marathon. I'd never run more than, I think I'd maybe run 10 miles on my own, maybe, but I'd never done a marathon and the Ironman has a marathon at the end. And then it has a two and a half mile swim, which I wasn't worried about. I don't think I'd swum two and a half miles. Maybe I had, um, but uh, I had not, I hadn't been on a bike since I was a teenager and I was 34 when I started training, 33, I was 33. And yeah, I took nine months off uh, because I, it was after Baywatch and I loved shooting Baywatch and I'd done a whole bunch of movies and a, another pilot, maybe two pilots for other networks. And it just, they were nice. They were good, but they weren't that community in the home that I had. And I just, I was okay. I thought, you know, I need another adventure. And I was worried it was going to ruin my career, but it turned out to be actually very good for my acting career because after you come off a series like Baywatch, where everyone thinks you're just uh, incompetent and, and dumb. And I don't know, they just, they just don't give you any credit for anything. And then you go do an Iron Man, then it it's, it counteracts their former stereotype of you. So, um, and back then um, it was the nineties, 97. So mm, people weren't really doing the Ironman as much as they do now. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so awesome. I love Thank that. You. And, and how did, how did it go? I really didn't oh, read anything about that. Yeah. It great. Oh yeah. Well, great. I mean, I, I had, I struggled with something that I found a solution to later. I struggled with drinking water. Um, I would get this air bubble on the top of my chest and it made it hard Mm. to breathe. Mm. But later when I was doing some marathons, I discovered that if I had a a straw that and drank from a straw, so I would cut a little mini straw and keep it in my fanny pack. And then when I drank, instead of drinking out of uh, gulping air at the same time, I just took a straw and drunk that way. So I got rid of that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was 13 hours. So it's not like I'm a speed demon, but I certainly was well, under the cutoff, that's for sure. So I think I defied expectations, but I did train very hard. You know, I am a very, um, you know, I, I like to fall in school. I was very good at school. Cause I fought, I just did my homework and I did what I was asked. And same thing with the training. Um, my, my coach was a, a former Ironman winner. And so I did every single thing he asked me to do, except for one day out of that nine months. And he, he was kind of, a, um, a, a, a surprise because I think he too thought, oh my God, who is this person? She's never mm. even done a marathon. She doesn't really know how to ride a bike. 
He didn't know you. No, he didn't know me. He didn't know me. But he knows me now. <laughs> yeah, I bet. That's amazing. What are what are some of the things um now that are most challenging for you just in your life? I know well, one thing that I've heard you talk about is that you don't procrast procrastinate, you precrastinate. Is that is that the word? I had never heard that word before. And it kind of it very is very descriptive, like. I, I get what that means, is <laughs> which can be know. good, I think, sometimes, but also sometimes probably not so great. Right. So I am the opposite of a procrastinator. I will do things right mm -hmm. away and not, and then I'll forget um, whether I've done them or I won't give myself the time to really think about them. So there are, and, and sometimes things need to marinate before you rush in and finish a job. Right, right. Uh, so respond to an email or whatever. So um, there are some downsides, but I do. And so precrastinate was the, was the word for someone who doesn't procrastinate and does things right away. Um, I don't know if that, that article was written by someone who made up that word or not, but that's the word I use now. So um, it has served me well because I think my discipline has like I, and I'm not putting myself down when I say this, but I'm kind of an all round person. Like I'm okay at a lot of things. I'm not excellent at one specific thing. I'm not a genius in any way. So my discipline has enabled me to get ahead of other people who might be super talented, but don't have discipline. And um, it also has helped me feel good about myself so that I don't I'm always working on trying to be better and um, it makes my life happier, even though people go, God, don't you, you know, don't you want to relax? And I'm like, no, I do relax. I'm happy while you're relaxing and going, oh, I shouldn't be relaxing. I am having a great time at the gym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I think that my discipline, especially in my acting career served me really well because, you know, I'm a, I'm an okay actress. I'm, I'm fine. I can, I certainly can make dialogue that's not great, believable, which is a challenge. And I don't know if some of the Oscar winners would be able to do that. But um, I and have worked under really, really stringent conditions. So when, you know, I heard once um, oh, Charlize Theron say, oh, my God, I shot this movie in 18 days and it was so hard. And I thought, 18 days? Girl, you're so lucky because the the higher budget movies always take longer. But if you're in the independent film world like I am, I mean, I've done big, big studio features, but I've done a lot of independence. You are cranking through. There's no, you know, there's no big warm trailer that you hang out in until, you know, mm -hmm. the you're it's you're on the set working, shooting the next scene. So my discipline has gotten me, uh, I think, to uh a place where I might not have normally gotten to in acting mm -hmm. if yeah. I wasn't disciplined. Yeah. Well, so many things that you've accomplished. I mean, the discipline has been with you for, for it seems like your whole life. Yeah, no, yeah. it has. Cause I think I realized young, you know, Alexandra, yeah. you're not it's like super good at anything. When I was in, in grade school, I wasn't a very good athlete. I was a good student, but only because I really worked hard. I was a very good student. I worked super hard at it. I wasn't mm -hmm. like one of those people who, who just could not do the homework and mm -hmm. study. Well, that's so, an extraordinary yeah, thing in and of itself that your, you know, your dri drive, the drive you had to, mm, to thank you. do. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary, you know, thank but you. I, I know what you mean. I kind of feel very similar myself. Like I'm, I'm good at a lot of things. I'm very well-rounded. I've got a lot of things that I've learned to do because, you know, being a solopreneur, you learn to do a lot of things. You know, I'm not an Olympic athlete, but I can do a lot of different, you know, calisthenics exercises. There's just, yeah, but but the drive is there and yes, the getting up every and I day. I see that in you. I see that in you very, very much. And I think in the in the end, I think we're lucky to have that. I think we are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. As we wrap up here, Alexandra, I think when we were just chatting before we popped on, we were talking about a couple of the books, Pema Chodron. Uh, I just, you, you had said you read which book of hers? 
I read uh, When Things Fall Apart. Things Fall Apart. And I just read uh, How We Live is How We Die, which I have now assigned to two of my private clients to read because it she just has such an incredible way of expressing and and the grief I'm going through with shy and um did you read that at an, at an opportune time that was when you, you needed know, it passed yeah. around my family before my brother Jonathan who became the vegan when he was 14 he went to um, prison for three and a half years for an animal rights um, oh, wow. issue. And it was super hard on everybody. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that book was passed around our family. And I give it to people um, when they have a breakup or a loss because it's it's just really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I recommend yeah. it. It's really easy to read too, like all her books. Yeah. Yeah. And this other one about grief and then and aging. And you had said, you know, I'm thinking a lot about mortality. Do you want to kind of share what what you're thinking about and why? And as we wrap well, up. Well, remember when I said earlier in our in our talk today that when I, I thought that when I was 21, I was going to be old. Yeah. yeah. And now I look back and go, you know what? If I had learned to dance, because I remember thinking also, I'm 21, I'm too old to learn to dance. If I'd learned to dance when I was 21, 40 years later, now I would be like an expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so to everybody who's out there going, I'm too old. I know that at 60, I'm going to look back when I'm 70 and go, Alexandra, 60 is young. So I recognize I'm excited for this decade, but I'm also really aware because I'm um, taking care of my mom, who's 87, how aging affects us. And it doesn't, my mom was super healthy and it's, um, she has Parkinson's. So there's a lot that she, you know, it's not because she didn't take care of herself. Cause I think she's doing so well because she did take care of herself, mm -hmm. but it's just uh, makes you feel uh, vulnerable when you see someone who your mother, you know, fading. And then you know that, well, we all do it. Right. But it's so easy to be able to not think about it mm -hmm. unless it's kind of in your face more. And then, you know, I, I see that in our sixties that, you know, people dying. And I think, my God, that guy was 61 and he died of a heart attack. Um, I'm 60. I mean, I could only have one year to live. So it's in, in a way it's good because it makes you more um, less fearful mm -hmm. of being on this, what we do on this planet. And then also more grateful. All comes back to gratitude, right? Yeah. Always does. Attitude. The attitude of gratitude and our attitude is really important. And for a healthy life, a long, yes. healthy life too. So yeah. holistically healthy. And I think you're a shining example of that. Are there any last words you'd like to share and any, any, mm -hmm. any projects you're working on or anything, or are you just pretty focused on family right now? And yeah, I'm, I, I still, aud I've auditioned a little bit, but unfortunately, even if I were to get a, a job offer, I, I, it would have to be a good one for me to leave my mom, yeah. but I'm still auditioning just to be in the game. So I'm not invisible. Um, and uh, yeah, so no, I'm just working um, a lot with animal rights and um, things with direct action everywhere and the simple heart. And I am excited for this year to do more work for animals and to speak on overpopulation. So if anyone is listening and has a class, I really have been doing outreach to universities to see if I can speak in on the issue of human fertility and population to science classes, math co classes. Um, and I, ha I don't get a lot of response because I think people are so afraid of this issue, environmental mm -hmm. studies classes. So if anybody wants me to speak, especially if they are doing classes online, I spoke at several universities this year, um, but I'd like to do more. And um, so if anybody listening has an in, please, uh, you know, write to Ella to, and she'll send it to me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Alexandra, thank you for all the work you've done and continue to do and for sharing this time and space with me. I, I really appreciate it. It's been an honor speaking with you, Ella. Thanks. Hey.